We Get Outdoors Nation. It's my delight to bring to you tonight travel blogger and photographer extraordinaire Melissa Miller, all the way from Northern California. Um, she's incredible. Go check out her Instagram page, but more of that later. Um, Melissa, welcome to this episode of the We Get Outdoors podcast. How are you doing? Hey, thank you so much for having me. I am doing well. So the, the thing that we always like to ask first is, is you're into traveling, you're into writing, you're into photography, but no tree grew itself without starting from a seed. Where did you get this seed of passion for this funny old occupation of traveling, blogging, photography from? Oh, it, you know, it's, it's a long journey. It was a long journey to get here. I grew up in a really small town in Michigan, rural Michigan, and really didn't do much traveling. My parents, we kind of did some local camping trips, but I had never even been on a plane until I was 21. <laughs> so my travel journey started kind of later in life. And um, I kind of took off from there. When I got on a plane and went to San Francisco and visited my uncles, I explored the city with my sister and really just craved those new experiences after that. So once I was working and had more money to actually afford some travel on my own, I made a point to travel just around the United States. Um, and that led to national parks, which even, I mean, I just got more obsessed with national parks and outdoor spaces and yeah, I kind of took off from there. How was, so, um, my journey into the outdoors was similar to yours. I was, I think I was 20 when I flew for the first time. Do you remember those sensations of going to the airport and your first flight and all those things? How was it? Oh my gosh, I was so nervous. <laughs> and it was a like unexpected. It was like a rough trip too. Like I looked to the woman sitting next to me and I was like, is this normal? And she's like, no. I was like, oh no, this is not good. <laughs> Just a really bumpy ride into San Francisco. <laughs> Wow, but then I guess you had, did you have the beautiful view coming into San Francisco airport with the Golden Gate Bridge and that sort of thing? Of course, yes. Awesome. And then, so then you told me as we're talking before we came on and started recording that you, you qualified as an occupational therapist. And, and I guess you've mm -hmm. done that for a little while. We have to pay the bills somehow, hey? Um, how, how did you transition that brave step of going, I'm going to turn away the guaranteed paycheck and now I'm going to write and take photo photographs for a living? Oh, it was a combination of things, but it's been kind of a slow transition. I've been wanting to transition that way. Um, I've been doing travel occupational therapy for the last couple of years, which is basically you take on um, short contracts with places that are really needing help. Um, so that allowed me to travel to Washington and I ended up living there for three years and then Alaska and now California. So I was here when the, in California when the pandemic hit. Um, because of the pandemic, my student loans are on, they're paused. Um, I was able to save up money, pay off some credit cards, all that. And I have a supportive boyfriend that is a videographer. So I was able to kind of take a step into that, um, yeah, a new career for the first time. And I'm very excited about it. That is super cool. What were you up to in Alaska? That's on my bucket list of places to visit. <laughs> I was working there as an occupational therapist in Juneau. Um, I wasn't, I didn't know where I was going to be stationed. I was hoping, you know, Anchorage, so I'd have access to all the eight national parks that are there. <laughs> but instead I got put in Juneau, which I am grateful for, but there's only 40 miles of road. <laughs> so I got to know Juno really well. I was there for about five months, um, wow. July through December. So I got to see uh, some of the seasons too. And yeah, it got dark at like 2 p.m. So that's when I was like, I'm going to go to California now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Almost doing what a lot of other Alaskans do, which is take their RV to Baja for the winter. Right. <laughs> I could see why. <laughs> so how was the outdoors? And did you get out much in, in the outdoors and wandering around the Juneau area? What, what was it like? Yeah. So there were five uh, major like mountain peaks there. And I tried to do all of them. I got four. I was close. Good job. Um, but yeah, it was, I mean, it's breathtaking. There's 
views of the glacier just from the highway. There's, I mean, there's multiple glaciers too. Um, it's just mountains on both sides and, and the ocean too. I mean, it's, it's just breathtaking. So every day on my work commute, it was just like, wow, I cannot believe I live here. <laughs> yeah. But I, yes. I, lots of outdoor opportunities there. It's, Yes, I say it's on my bucket list. It's just somewhere I never got to uh, or haven't got to yet. I, I've lived and worked in um, in Seattle. Well, actually, um, uh, oh, Sammamish uh, and, and worked in Seattle for a while and did the drive over the over the floating bridges with Mount Rainier off to one side and Mount Baker off the oh, other yeah. side as you drive to work every day. And there's something, the Olympics right in front of you. And there's something very, there's something very special about that, that, when a trip to work is immensely pleasurable because of the scenery work sort of changes. Yes. It's so, yeah, it's so true. I, that's why my contract in Seattle uh, went from three months uh, to, it ended up being three years. <laughs> I just couldn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special place. The rain in winter can suck a bit, but apart from that, it's a very special yeah. place. Well, for me, it was a step up from Michigan winter. So I was, you know, slowly getting better. <laughs> Although moving to Juneau then was a step in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. We're heading north as opposed to south. So how, yeah. how do you work out what to write about? I mean, do you just pick a destination and go there and figure it out afterwards? Do you come up with a plan? What's, what's the way forwards? It's usually pretty spontaneous. <laughs> it's usually... I mean, usually I'm just enjoying the trip, not really thinking about blogging, um, would just travel a lot with my friends, plan road trips. Um, and then after, yeah, I would, a lot of people would ask like, oh, where did you go when you were there? And that would just kind of motivate me to put together a blog post kind of talking about what people would be interested in, um, what gear I use, you know, just, it's kind of based on what people on Instagram tell me they want to know about. And that, that kind of fuels my my blogging motivation because otherwise I'm just kind of writing into an abyss and it's for nobody. And if I'm just writing about my, my travels for me, it's kind of, I don't know, I don't find much enjoyment out of that, mm. but sharing it with other people definitely is where I find my motivation. What is it they most want to know about on Instagram? Um, on Instagram, it's mostly itinerary based. Um, I mean, I'm sure you've had this conversation where, trails and spots become overcrowded you know responsible tagging that that conversation so it, it's a lot of like oh where did you take this picture <laughs> so I'm trying to steer it more in the direction of here's how you can find spots like this too and plan your own road trips rather than you know here's exactly where I went which I, I do some of that too because itineraries are fun and I do enjoy talking about it because I put a lot of time into planning my trips mm. sometimes <laughs> sometimes I sometimes. think that, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are maybe I won't say cash rich and time poor but certainly time poor when it comes to traveling and yes th there's a certain magic in finding the unknown spot yourself and getting either just a mind's eye picture or a or a real photograph that you've taken um there's a certain magic in it but it also that requires risk because you could spend a week exploring to find that perfect place and, and not find anything um right have, have you had any dramatic misses where you've been like looking for that unique hidden spot and never found it or um i'm sure i have i <laughs> for me luckily i'm thankful that traveling in general and just being outside is is really what makes me the happiest it's not it's not so much about the photos or or the blog content i mean it's it's a bonus if i can spin it after you know to get content but i mean for me just in general exploring and and having those experiences are great and especially if i'm on a road trip with friends like even if we're somewhere that's not very scenic it's still such a good time but yes, I've definitely, I've definitely had some spots where I'm like, oh, where are we? <laughs> this is not very great. <laughs> where was, where was one that jumps out to you right now? There is a spot in Oregon. I, 
I hate to even say it because it is beautiful, but like the spot we were going to kind of like what I was just saying, like Instagram makes these places sometimes look better than they are. So it was, I was went, I went with a friend and we went to this like kind of boardwalk spot in the painted hills mm-hmm. of Oregon, which you just wouldn't think it's in Oregon, but it's, it's like this beautiful red kind of sand landscape um, with even like different colored striations in the, in the dunes. Uh, but we got there and the boardwalk was like, I don't know, like maybe 50 feet long. It was like the shortest little thing. And we drove so long to get there. And honestly, the drive-in was prettier than this spot. So we're like, what? What is this? Huh? <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. Um, and, and so then do, do you have a, um, a perfect spot somewhere that you'd like to go back to over and over and over again? Oh gosh. Um, Banff National Park in Canada. <laughs> it's just unreal. What, what is it about yeah, the mountains National there? Park. The mountains are, it's the Canadian Rocky Mountains and they are just so dramatic the way they're like jutting out of the land They're They've got a bunch of like stripes the water is like Gatorade blue and it's, you know, you think like, Oh, it's probably enhanced, you know, on Photoshop. And and then you get there and you're like, no, no, this is real life. This is (laughs) incredible. Yeah. That's amazing. I can spend so much time there. There's a Valley. If ever you get to Europe uh, in your travels, there's a Valley in Northern, uh, Northern Italy um called the mm. the saska valley in fact actually at the end of the v- valley what part of a james bond film was filmed there but that's a uh, that's by the by but this ba- valley for every 10 minutes you drive up it you go back 20 years in time and the buildings get older the cars get older even the clothing of the people gets older um oh, wow. a- a- and you get up there and you end up in places where there's roman bridges that are over 2000 years old crossing this river and the river is perfect, um, like sapphire gin, that blue color. Um, it is that perfect color with, with wow. green pine trees and alpine mountains with snow peaks and 2,000 year old bridges and, and um, <laughs> remains of buildings all in this one space. And it's, it's like a place you could go and lose yourself there for two weeks and, and not want to leave. You just, I, I spent a few days there just reading a book and looking around and you can't really concentrate on your book because it's so pretty. You just keep putting your book down and looking with your mouth wide open. It's uh, high on my bucket list of places for people to visit. Oh. If you ever get an opportunity to, it's incredible. You sold me. <laughs> <laughs> Adding it to the list. <laughs> Add it to the list. And, and of course, there's amazing pizza, pasta, Italian red wine, gelato, everything there made by um, little old Italian ladies normally who uh, are frank. I think they're cooking it in their home and serving it in their front room sort of thing. It's, uh, wow. it's, it's magical. So if you want, I can send it you a pin like on Google it. Earth to go and find it one day. Add it to your list. I will. I have not been to Europe yet at all. So that is just in general, high on my list. Wow. Well, when this hope pandemic pandemic is, is settled itself down, hopefully the borders will open. But how are you managing? I mean, you're, you're setting up as a tra- travel blogging and photography <laughs> in a time when everybody said, don't travel, it's bad. How are you managing it? I, at first, it was really difficult because I felt kind of lost. Like, what what do I have to contribute right now? Like, I, I'm kind of a jerk if I, you know, really put out all of these beautiful blog posts about itineraries about that I've done in the past that are beautiful because people can't go there right now. And it's, and it's irresponsible of me to even, you know, push that as a influencer to like, you know, travel safely, try to stay close to home. So it's been, it's been tricky, but I mean, luckily I'm in a spot in Northern California that has so much to explore with but the redwoods, the coast, there's dunes here. If you drive slightly in, there's um, like Shasta area, the Mm. Trinity Alp Mountains. So there's a lot that I have not seen. I haven't spent much time exploring California outside of the major cities. So it's been good that way where I've been able to kind of focus more on 
local travel content and also encouraging people, you know, when, when travel is safe, here's how you can plan an epic road trip or here's how you can, you know, travel on, you know, more affordably. So mm. I've been focusing more on that stuff. That's cool. I think there's probably far more in our back gardens than we actually realize by, by, by backyards. I mean, you know, the, within the nearest hundred yeah. miles, there's, there's probably far more floating around there than people ever realize in terms of beauty and scenery and animals and opportunities. Mm -hmm. What, what is it in North California that particularly you, you love? Where have you got a favorite place or, or I don't know. Oh, there's so many <laughs> depends on if I want the redwoods or the coast but there's a few places north of me. There's the Lady Bird Johnson Trail. That is this really beautiful grove of redwoods. Um, and then just a little bit further from that is Fern Canyon. Um, it's, have you heard of it? I have heard of it. Yeah, it's, Jeff told me about it. Yeah. It's beautiful. I mean, it's just this, you're in this canyon filled with ferns. It's exactly how it sounds, but it's, <laughs> it's very magical. And especially if the sunlight's coming in right and it's, you know, there's some water. It's, it's gorgeous. Wow. Oh, okay. Stop it. Cause otherwise my list is going to get bigger of places <laughs> I have to go visit again or go visit at all. So you've, you've mentioned road trip several times. Like what's the recipe to the perfect road trip? Do you have one or? Oh, it, it depends on your style of travel. Um, for me, I like to have a little more structure. I like to, I can get a little type A sometimes. So I like to know like, where's a general place of where we want to be and where are we going to sleep? And I like to have those, um, I guess, more stressful details planned out. And it, I guess the art is leaving enough room for to have some spontaneous events too. Like, oh, we see this you know, sign on the side of the road. What is this? Let's go check it out. So not planning it so strictly that you can't divert if you want, but, but having a general guideline and then kind of floating around from there. What's the, the top thing for you? Because when, when I talk about the outdoors, people often think that it's the, the hiking that's important to me or the kayaking that's important to me or the photography that's important to me. And actually, none of those things are that important. It's all more about the the perfect location and the perfect people to share the location with. And then whether we're hiking, driving, sailing, kayaking, it doesn't really bother me, to be honest. Um, what's, what, what's your leaning to in when, when you go travel? Is, is it about location, about people, about the pursuit? I don't know. What is it? Um, for me, it's mostly about the people that I'm with. Um, but I I do really love new experiences. So if it's a new national park that I haven't been to or a new area, um, I get really excited about that. So even if, even if it's not that great of a national park, I mean, that's pretty impossible, but if it's one of the less popular ones, you know, <laughs> um, it's still super exciting to me. You love uh, all of it. Yeah. Regardless. I do love all of it. Yes. Wow. That's so, oh, I love it. I love it. I love to share time with somebody who loves, loves being out and about doing stuff. I think as much as, uh, as, as much as I do. Um, and with, with all of that, like where, where next, what next, what are you up to? What's, what's going on? I mean, the, is it, is the pandemic quietening down enough in North America to start traveling again, or are you restricted to North California for a while longer or what do you think? Um, I, d I definitely have seen a lot of people traveling. I mean, it's record tourism here in Northern California. So there's definitely people out. Um, for me personally, I'm trying to stay mostly just within the Pacific Northwest for right now. I have a sister in Portland, so I end up that way. And most of my friends are still in Washington. So I've been planning, you know, just a couple trips there. Um, and usually just car camping. You know, I make sure not to like, really stay at any like established campgrounds or I've been I've been pretty um cautious I guess um mm -hmm. I do see a lot of people traveling but I I don't foresee the pandemic going away anytime soon here and it's it's been kind of fluctuating quite a bit so I I don't know <laughs> if I can answer that question mm. but I would like to travel more I 
I would really like to make it to a warmer area, like maybe the desert or the Southwest um, this winter, but it, it kind of depends on the area and the community. You know, I don't want to impact any small communities in any negative ways, especially, you know, native populations. Like that's, that's a big deal there too. So um, cautious, but I'm hoping that travel will be, come more um, safe as time goes on. I don't know, the, the idea of being crammed up on an aeroplane with loads of other people who could be coughing and spluttering around you just like sends cold shivers of horror down my spine. Yes, I don't think I could get on an airplane anytime soon. <laughs> mm -mm, mm -mm. I've, I'm, I'm supposed to come to North America in the next four, five months, by the end of January anyway, next year. Um, and I'm currently sat, so you know, in Johannesburg, South Africa um, is where I am today. And, um, oh, okay. and, I, and I have been for the whole duration of lockdown. So this is a, uh, mm. yeah, I'm, I'm not from here. And, um, yeah. and then I, I started doing the maths about how many hours in an airplane is required to get to Seattle, because that's where I need to go to. And it's like 26 hours in an airplane to get to Seattle. And I'm, I'm just, I don't know if I can bring myself to do it. 26 hours. Wow. <laughs> I don't know if I could even just without a pandemic. <laughs> it sounds like a long flight. <laughs> I've, I've done it a lot of times. So it's two flights and I've done it. Oh, I've probably done it hundreds of times. Like I've lost track as to how many times I've made that trip. And there is no easy way of doing it. Like you either fly to Atlanta and then fly internally or you fly to Dubai and then fly. Um, oh, you still there? Oh, there we are. Oops. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, that's it. Uh, then you either fly to Dubai and then fly Dubai straight to Seattle, but there isn't an easy, pleasant, short, uh, direct, easy way of achieving it. And uh, I have no idea how I'm going to manage it. It's probably going to have to happen, but I have no, no idea how to make it yeah. work. Right. A lot of people are in that position. It's it's tough. It is. It is. Anyway, that's doom and gloom. Tell me what I'm. What, what I want to know is, um, what if you were to plan the perfect traveling experience for yourself? Let's take COVID off the table and say unlimited budget, unlimited time. You can plan it and go sometime in the next eighteen months. Like, what is it that you choose to go and do? Ooh. I would probably choose road tripping around New Zealand. Um, I have always wanted to explore New Zealand, but I would love to spend quite a bit of time there because it is, I mean, from what I've seen and heard, it looks absolutely stunning. And I would like to get into the back country there. I'd like to have a lot of different experiences there. And um, yeah, that's, that's always kind of been high on my list. That's but, cool. You, you run oh, out of uh, tarmac yeah. roads very quickly in New Zealand, by the way. So um, yeah, I, I haven't been to New Zealand for 10 years, but on the South Island in New Zealand, when I was there last, there is, um, there's about 50 kilometers or 50 miles of um, double lane highway. So two lanes going in each direction. And then it goes to single okay. lane and then it goes to dirt roads. And that's New Zealand. It's incredible. I love it. Oh, that sounds great. And, and you can car camp or camp for free in hundreds of thousands of different places out there for just just for complete there's there's a water tap there's a long drop toilet and a campground by a lake and help yourself and leave it clean and tidy that's oh that's great yes that's, very high on my list <laughs> so, so how would you use that time in in um in new zealand driving around and seeing what happens would you have a plan uh like what 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 would you do with it Ooh, yeah i would definitely have a plan i usually go on a few different websites and apps to plan things out um i was actually just writing a blog post about this <laughs> i like to spend time on google earth i'm sure you've also done that where you can just kind of zoom into all the mountains and lakes I, if I see like any kind of turquoise lake, I'm just like, oh, what is that? And I zoom into that. <laughs> but uh, um, I like to check out a lot of blog posts since I am a blogger. I find blogs to be very valuable. I think um, a lot of people that are travel bloggers take a lot of time and really 
put the details into travel itineraries that you don't really see um, on like tourism websites as much. So that's kind of where I find my inspiration and my, inf my information about travel is travel blogs. Obviously, social media plays a part in that, too. If I see a picture of a place, I'm like, oh, what is that? I, I save it to a folder. I pretty much have a folder for every country and state. It's, it's getting out of control. But <laughs> uh, so whenever I plan a trip somewhere, I can look back in that folder and see the places that um, I've kind of pinned um, yeah, I would, I would try to balance it out so that I'm not super exhausted. Cause I, when I first started traveling, when I was younger, I just wanted to travel so bad and so much that I would just pack in all these experiences and be so tired that I didn't really care about the experiences anymore. Mm. So finding that balance of getting enough rest and, you know, if, if there's a lot of hiking, kind of spacing it out so that there's hiking and then there's travel days, you know, in a, smart way it's kind of fun it's like tetris you know fitting everything in just perfectly <laughs> i i kind of love it <laughs> and and do you like so this i always think there's two different ways of traveling so there's the squeezing as much as possible into the shortest possible time frame <laughs> or there's yeah. the or there's the opposite of that which is to truly experience something at the deepest possible level but not necessarily do that much do you have a preference which way you sit on that or what do you like the most? I like to be, uh, I like to be in the middle of those. I, I do like to explore a few places. I don't usually like to just travel and stay in one area. Um, but I do want to stay in a place long enough that I can talk to the local people and, you know, get to experience the cuisine there and see, you know, the nature sites and rather than just going for like one spot, you know, cause I know a lot of people that do that where they have this one photo in mind. So they go just for this one spot and then they move on. But I don't know. I like to, I like to learn the history of a place and mm. dig a little bit deeper, but not stay too long, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, so we're in the middle. I get restless pretty easy. So I was going to ask, do you get itchy feet? Yeah, I do. Now I've, I've just <laughs> up your Instagram account on my iPhone. And um, if anybody hasn't oh. seen it yet, they should go and check out at miss.rover. Um, I'll put that in the show notes beneath that or well, I won't do it, but the editor will do it for us. Um, Cause he's <laughs> great. Um, but oh, uh thanks. Like you take some incredible pictures. What is the secret to taking images like this? Like, what's your magic source? <laughs> well, a lot of it is in collaboration with other photographers. So because I am an influencer on my page, it's mostly me, photos of me. So most of the photos are not taken by me. Um, although on my blog, I usually try to incorporate more of my own photos. But it's it's good to communicate with the photographer and and kind of you know if if I have an idea in mind I can definitely have that executed by just telling the photographer what I want but it's harder when you're traveling with people that um, aren't photographers but there's nothing wrong with that either uh, a lot of iPhone photography is fantastic too I'd say just whatever gear you have learn how to use that to the best of your abilities there's a ton of resources on youtube that are fantastic <laughs> yeah i mean we're, we're launching a tv channel at the moment for we get outdoors um we're, we're just in like that beta testing of it before we push it out there for everybody to go and see but a, a competitor to discovery channel that's what we're busy pushing right okay now. and um, yeah we've, we've been looking about how can uh, people who are filming um, episodes for us how can they get the maximum value i suppose um or, or get the maximum quality without dropping you know a hundred thousand dollars on specialist stuff and we right. in the testing phase we've been gobsmacked about what a new iphone does and how much money you have to spend to get better than a new iphone like it's it's ludicrous you know you're in it's, for yeah to get better you're in for fifteen thousand dollars and lenses and this and that and whatever else it's crazy. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I get to see that side with my boyfriend being a videographer. So it's, I'm like, well, I'm just going to stick with my iPhone. <laughs> 
but I mean, and that's, I get a lot of questions asking, you know, like what camera gear do you use? You know, and it's some of my most popular Instagram photos are iPhone photos. So I like to encourage people just to start where they're at. I was just about to ask about the gear and you, the, the gear you use for <laughs> photography and you're kind of stealing my thunder, I suppose. But that's good. Um, <laughs> well, I do, do have a DSLR too that I use. Well, I was just about to ask. So I lug a, a DSLR around with me, uh, a Canon, uh, I can't remember, 5 something or other. 5D, I think. <laughs> um, I, I lug one of those around with me everywhere and then take 80% of my photographs and video with my iPhone. And I've, I've yes. now got into the stage where I'm like, I'm just going to leave the camera behind because it seems irrelevant. What, what is it? Right. What gear do you take with you? What do you use? What do you like using? Um, what do you advise other people to use other than, other than their smartphone, I suppose? Yeah, um, I do take my, I have a Canon 80D. It's, I, I bought that one. I didn't really know what I was doing, to be honest. I bought that one because I had a lens already that would work with that one. And Perfect. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's heavy and I do a lot of backpacking. So I look at that and I look at my film camera because I like taking film um, photos as well. Mm. And I have to like, I sometimes have to choose because I don't want to carry both. It's, it's really heavy. Um, but sometimes I'll just share a camera with my boyfriend we'll just bring one but mostly like I use my iPhone a lot of the time for like story content short videos that I use on you know Instagram's new reel um feature mm. but there's some small cameras out there too I started off with a Canon G7X and it's really small it's smaller than a cell phone I've got one I liked having yeah. it yeah yeah, yeah. they're like vlogging cameras too mm. um I liked having it for travel because it, I didn't always have to have my cell phone out because part of traveling, I like to try to unplug a little. And if I'm always taking my cell phone out, there's always that temptation of getting on social media or checking my email. And, but now I've just learned that my G7X is actually lower quality than my iPhone. So mm -hmm. now I'm like, well, I guess I'm back to iPhone. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, you can shoot 4K on an iPhone now, so um, what's not yeah. to love? Exactly. And if you get a gimbal um, for your iPhone, too, you know, you can take that out and make really smooth videos. What? The world is going crazy. It's getting more and more miniature, yeah. isn't it? So you, you, yeah, mentioned, it is. you mentioned backpacking. Like, wh where do you love going backpacking? Is there a... a I mean, it's interesting in talking to you because you haven't mentioned the same place twice yet. And... and <laughs> A lot of people have, have a favorite place. I mean, do you have a favorite place or? I don't know if I could pick a favorite place. Um, in, somewhere, in general, somewhere, that given, somewhere that given the opportunity, you'd go, I'll go back there again and again and again and again and again. And it, and it, would, it would be great every time. Washington. <laughs> like, I mean, there's Mount Rainier, there's the olympics i love the north cascades so much that is probably one of my favorite places to explore and without living in seattle or like in that area i feel like it's hard to cover ground there um so that was something i really enjoyed living in seattle um and i do still end up going back and my first backpacking trip of this entire year was in washington so i drove back to go there and backpack whereabouts did you backpack in washington I went to Gem Lake. It's a pretty popular hike. Um, mm. I can't remember what highway it's off of. I want to say off of 90, in, kind of in the Cascades. Yeah. Wow. It was beautiful. The mosquitoes were horrendous. Though. <laughs> it was so bad. I was wearing my fancy little um, bug mesh net over my hat, just sitting in my tent like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but as soon as the sun went down it was great uh, and it was a beautiful sunset too but i love backpacking you love backpacking what is it about backpacking yes. that's so special to you i think the unplugging for me just being somewhere without service putting my phone away i try to take my watercolor paints and paint something that i can kind of just like 
it's almost like meditation in a way because you're just so focused on this one thing and you're not thinking about everything else and you're in this beautiful area beautiful place just kind of I don't know being with yourself and it kind of gives me time to I guess check in a little more um when I'm home and working I'm kind of always trying to like do something or figure something out or I'm just thinking about other things rather than thinking about how I'm feeling or reflect on you know am I going in the direction I want to be going in with my career or what I'm doing and I, I find that backpacking definitely gives me those opportunities. Mm, I, I, I agree. I've just spent a weekend in the African bush um, this, this past weekend in my four by four and, um, and, and hanging out with a few friends and it, it's counterintuitive because I did nothing for four days. Well, other than wander around the African bush and not get eaten by lions. It's always a priority not getting eaten by lions. Yeah. Um, and in doing nothing, I've had now, what is it, Tuesday now, I've had two days back at work and I've got probably five days worth of productivity done, having done nothing for four days. Um, and I've had some of the best ideas about work, life, things by doing nothing. I think it's so important to do that. Turn the phone off, get rid of the electric things and um, just sit somewhere for a while. Yes, absolutely. I, I, and it's I, a privilege to be able to do that for sure. It is because while it's cheap, it's actually not that cheap. Have you ever added up the value of what's in your backpack on your back? Yes. I mean, and every time people ask me about gear and I made a gear guide recently, it's like, Oh wow. It's so expensive. There's such a big barrier to get into it. And also just, you know, the education and knowledge of like where to even go and like, how, how do you do these things? You know, I was lucky that I had a friend um, in Michigan that kind of showed me the ropes before I moved out to Washington, but it's a lot. It's a lot. It is. What, tell me about your gear and about the article you just wrote. I mean, people should go check it out. There's a link to your blog in your Instagram page. So they should go click on that and go yes. and read the article. But, um, but give, give us a quick, a quick snapshot um what, what's your favorite gear what will you never leave home without um what's the what's the cheapest bit of gear that you've got that um I have so many questions but what's the cheapest bit of gear you've got that's like <laughs> the best bit of gear as well so for instance i've got a um i've got a decathlon i don't know if you know decathlon it's a european outdoor sporting brand and i've okay. got their version of a blow-up thermarest that's as good, if not better than Thermarest, but about 25% of the price. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, so it's like 30 bucks for $30 for a, a blow up as good as a Thermarest, Thermarest. But if you puncture it, break it, lose it, you're not going to cry about it. Um, right. So, so what, tell me about your kit. What is it? What do you like? <laughs> I, I mean, I started with very basic things, which, I mean, even those are still pretty expensive. Um, I bought a basic two-person REI um, tent, backpacking tent. It's on the heavier side because usually the lighter it is, the more expensive it is, of course. And yep. I had a basic sleeping bag. Like most of my stuff, um, are you guys, are you familiar with REI? Mm the sporting goods store. Yeah. Very much so. That's kind of where I got most of my stuff because there was a store near me um, in Detroit where I was living for a while. And you can go in and everyone's kind of like trained. They're an expert. So they like help you try on things. They fit you to things. So I ended up getting a child's backpack <laughs> because I have a very short torso and I'm a short person. And it's way cheaper actually. Um, so I got kind of lucky there. <laughs> Uh, my, I think my least expensive piece of gear, I'm like really weirdly obsessed with these water shoes that my grandma bought me. They're really hideous, but, um, they were like bright blue with like a neon green stripe and they have like a rubber sole. They're so lightweight though. And if there's ever any river crossings, I can put those on and I don't cut up my feet on the rocks in the river and I have more traction 
And then also when I get to camp, I can wear those over socks, like sandals without Mm. having to lug around like, like my Chacos are very heavy and so are my Birkenstocks. So I don't want to take those into the backcountry. So Mm. these like really ugly water shoes that I spent like $15 on are my favorite. I don't know. It's my thing. (laughs) It's all cool. Listen, if if it works for you, use it and do it. Um, if, yes. if, other pe- if other people want to get into backpacking and get started, do you have any um, like gems or pearls of wisdom for them to, uh, to say like, here's, here's like a bit of a how to, what, what do you, what do you recommend people do? Yeah, I would say um, if you are able to find people to go with that have gone before, that is the most, I think that's the most helpful. That was helpful for me. Um, and even if you're new to an area or don't know people, There's a lot of Facebook groups or like meetup groups um, that you can join to find people that are kind of into that same thing. Like I'm part of a a women's group that um, there's people that have gone backpacking that haven't gone backpacking. So it's cool to kind of like, even just, even if you're going to go alone, you can still kind of ask them your questions before going out, get peace of mind, make sure you have everything you need. Um, So I would say connecting with people that have gone is definitely the most helpful. Mm. and how do you do the ultimate backpacking trick which is being supremely comfortable eating well staying warm staying dry without having i don't know 50 pounds on your back because there's like how do you manage that because there's so many people i know who've tried backpacking and have put the world its wife and all their friends in their backpack with them and they've turned a beautiful hike into a horrible hike because they're just exhausted and it's all too heavy. How do you manage that? Oh, it's a reminder every year, the first backpacking trip, I always bring too much and I'm like, Oh, I remember. Yeah, this is really heavy. Um, So I think unfortunately it's a lot of investing in high quality products. It's, I mean, you can, you can definitely go and make do. I, I made do with a lot of, really kind of bad things bad um, equipment for a long time but um, like my my jacket is really warm and it's it packs down like really small you know compression Um, just little things like that really add up unfortunately it's it's kind of a case of the more money you can spend (laughs) the better it's going to be but I mean just I like to think about like, okay, how much time am I really going to have like free time there? Am I going to be wanting to spend it mostly taking photos or am I going to have time to relax? Like, do I really need to bring this hardcover book? (laughs) Probably (laughs) not. (laughs) Cause every time I do, I never read it. So uh, little things like that. Um, Also, I think a big thing is definitely checking out the water sources on the way there. If there, if you see on the map, Um, I like to download a map on like all trails or whatever platform you can use and it'll show you where there's rivers or creeks. Um, If I know there's going to be adequate water on the trail, I'm not going to bring, you know, a full um, bladder and um, water bottle filled with water. Like, cause I have a three liter camelback bladder. Mm. Um, So if there's, if there's no water, then I can, I can survive, you know, um, a night or maybe even two, if I'm really cautious, but um, water's really heavy. Water's probably the heaviest thing I bring. <laughs> Water is scarily heavy, isn't it? That's the... Oh. Yes. Oh, I went and did a, explored a, a wilderness area here in South Africa um, a few months ago, and um, it's sort of like 200 miles from the nearest, where you start hiking is about 200 miles from the nearest tarmac road, and um it's an unfenced african wilderness mountain area with massive valleys cliffs mountain tops animals the whole everything you could imagine and um but the the cartography the mapping is appalling i mean oh no it's africa what am i supposed to expect you know a, a precision inch to a mile type map no we don't have any of that and so i had no idea what the water was going to be like and mm. it turns out, having been once, even at the driest season, there is actually water to find every few hours of hiking. And, and you can normally find oh. something. If you've got a good water filter as well, that, that pays some dividends. Um, but that first time I had 
think I had eight liters of water in, on my backpack because um, I was out oh. for four days and I was like, okay, two liters a day is going to suck in terms of hydration and eating. But as you said, I can survive on that if I absolutely have to. Oh my goodness me. Who did that to me? It was horrible. Oh no. <laughs> I, I am glad that like I use just a basic Sawyer mini water filter. They're like $20. Mm. So it's actually, thank goodness there are affordable water filters on the market. So that's not too much of a, a hindrance for people getting out. Yeah, that's it. Use it with those little like, not pencil ones, but little, little circular few inches long type ones. They're, mm-hmm. they're incredible. Those soy ones, you can put like a hundred thousand liters through one of those. I don't know what that is in pints or gallons or anything else, but that's, um, that's more water than you're going to drink in the next few years. That's for certain. Exactly. Yeah. They're great. And they're so lightweight too. Cool. Tell me, um, Melissa, what is it that you wish more people would do when they go and engage with the outdoors? Do you have like a, a thing you wish they'd do more of? Oh, there's a, probably a lot of things. <laughs> I mean, the obvious for any outdoor influencer is, you know, preaching the leave no trace principles. Um, definitely respecting the area and the land um i mean i've i've been to some places in washington that have definitely found quite a bit of trash and people going off trail that really leads to erosion and destroying some of the natural areas but i think another big one is is just finding some educational to, tools to to make sure that you're going to be safe because a lot of people can end up in really bad situations because they were not prepared. I I see a lot of people on the trail where it's just like blazing sun, 85 degrees, and they're carrying one small like Dasani water bottle. And I'm like, "Um, are you going the full way with just that? You know, it's kind of like, okay. Mm. (laughs) I think think just, and I, I feel like there's not a ton of education out there or people really you know the outdoors you know they say it's for everyone but i feel like it it is kind of it can have like an elitist exclusive feel to it sometimes it's like if if you have the money and if you have the you know the education and and so i think there's some barriers that that there are to to getting in the outdoors safely and to, to have a good time how do we start to reduce those barriers for people so we can get more people loving it without um yeah, by, by, and reduce the barriers to, that, that's currently stopped them. I think a lot of it is, I mean, definitely any outdoor influencers have a platform that they can use to, to educate. And, you know, if people connect with me and they're asking questions, I, I don't think I've ever not responded to a DM that is someone asking a genuine, you know, question about safety or gear. Um, also like, outdoor brands you know they they've got a lot of money they could definitely do more in that um i mean even just put out education um how even maybe access to less expensive gear i i don't know there's it's a conversation i've been having a lot lately Mm. um it's well if you want a partner to do something i'm happy to have the conversation (laughs) i i I, I, the outdoors has made such a profound difference in my life. And I guess it has in yours as well. Um, Absolutely. It's the thing that brings peace, harmony, tranquility, happiness into my, into my life, almost like magic. And I've taken a lot of disadvantaged young people into the outdoors over the years on on trips, Um, you know, sort of criminalized young people who've been in, in young offenders institutes and whatever else. And the difference it makes on their lives is profound as well. Yet, as you say, the, the barriers, it, it's almost like the outdoor brands, you know, I, I'm trying to go around the houses. They, they need to make money, obviously, to go and run their business. Like that's a, it's a given, right? The purpose of a business is right. kind of to serve people and make money. But on the flip side of the, the coin, their pursuit of money stops people going out and having a great time and having those experiences and then you end up with like a dichotomy um and so i've been recently recommending people to go to the sort of military surplus stores you know where they sell off 
used military stuff because you can get a X army sleeping bag that'll be amazing for you. It might be a little bit heavier than the REI or the mounted hardware equivalent, but will it keep you warm? Yes. Will it do the job? Yes. Is it going to cost you $10? Probably yes. You know, there's, there's plenty thrift stores. There's plenty of places you can go to to find kit. But I was wondering, mm-hmm. you know, is there a space for doing a, maybe here's maybe an idea for a blog for you, like how to get the best quality kit at the cheapest price. Um, where can you find this stuff? I don't know. That's a good question. I, I know there were some brands that were putting together some um, starter backpacking kits and giving them to um, like anyone in the black community that wanted to get into backpacking because there is a big there's a lack of representation there too so i mean if you see all these outdoor industries only featuring white people i mean that's a barrier too it is it is um i follow the tv program alone quite closely in fact i've got a friend who's Hmm. who's been on alone and um it was very interesting you know there's there's only really been one black guy on alone and for nine series or whatever it is uh, and that's been it And I think the outdoors is seen as a, it's seen as a white middle class playground that uh, that you've got to be part of that group to access it. Um, Mm -hmm. it, Almost not like money. You know, you've got to be the the right person in the right place with the right skin color. Uh, And somehow those barriers have to be, I suppose you can't force somebody of a a non-white middle class background to go in the outdoors and love it. But, but they, they should equally have a, a barrierless opportunity to go do it. Exactly. Yeah, I agree. Marvellous, marvellous. Right, I, I told you a little while ago that I was going to give you the opportunity to have a rant, Melissa. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm going to hand over the microphone to you for as long as you want to get whatever it is you would like to get off your chest. Um, uh, as us English say, um, and and so o- over to you. What would you like to share with the world that's that's Ooh. frustrating you, delighting you, or anything anything else? I feel like we just touched on a lot of those things that I would oh, rant on. on. I mean, definitely. I I think. I mean, outdoor brands. Yes, they need to make money. I mean, everyone needs to make money, but I mean, capitalism definitely encourages making more money than you need and exploiting so I guess just in general like since the Black Lives Matter movement um, just looking at brands and looking at other people white outdoor influencers like myself that I just feel like we're not doing enough and I mean I'm I'm struggling too to figure out how I can help how I can you know continue to amplify and I just I have so many friends that are just not saying anything or doing anything and I just navigating that has been really hard for me it's like do I talk to them and what do I when I do what do I say like it's a lot of it's a lot of uncomfortable things and it, I've also like you see as soon as like leave no trace that they latch onto that and they just like preach that to no end. But, but like our black community isn't able to even access the outdoors as safely as we are. So it's, it just seems kind of, to me, it's like we have our priorities wrong, (laughs) you know? So I I don't know. I don't even know. I'm just going to talk in a circle if I keep going. So (laughs) <laughs> that's kind of the basis <laughs> so if we were to Where change my head's been at <laughs> that's cool that's cool if we were to change those priorities what, what sort of adaptions to those priorities do you think we need to make to change the outcome i mean less like exploitation in general like i mean even just being an influencer and a photographer like i i get brands you know constantly asking to promote stuff for them for free. And, you know, I definitely, I've definitely noticed them going to more of the black community too and doing that. It's like, no, (laughs) people need to be compensated. And um, there's just been so much exploitation of people and of land. And I think if we focus on, on that and changing the system, instead of focusing just on money and greed and that, that maybe 
I don't know, maybe if we focus on people, I'm not sure the answer, but it, it's hmm. just, I feel like leave no trace will come naturally if we focus on reducing exploitation. Leave, leave no trace is a, a natural, a natural thing that people will do if they truly love the outdoors, regardless of yeah. race, race, religion, gender, or any of the above. It's a natural, or if you truly love it, you won't screw it up. Right. Maybe that's, that's a thought, but I, I, yeah, my thoughts have been all over the place on this stuff lately. Hmm. I think it's important that we have these like discussions and I don't think that any one of us is going to get to any form of right answer. Um, no. And and it's highly likely that there is no perfect answer as well, um, because there isn't really perfect answers to much in the world. I mean, you are an occupational therapist, and people won't do the perfect advice you give them. Do you know what I mean? They you'll say go do right. these stretches and that whatever else, in, in the knowledge that if they do ten percent of it, you'll kind of have to be happy with it. Um, so mm-hmm. there's probably not going to be a perfect solution that that is actually achievable or executable. Like there's a, maybe a perfect theory, but not necessarily the, the, the delivery. But um, right. I, I, I do think we need to find ways of gently sharing with anybody who doesn't engage in the outdoors currently a, um, a, a, like a baby steps. Um, I was taken into the outdoors when I was super young by my dad and my mum and I was taking you know, outdoor fa- family holidays were camping. Um, and, but it was all gentle and baby steps for a child. And then when I look at people who take adults into the outdoors, they kind of go and say, Hey, you're 30 years old. So we're just going to treat you like a 30 year old should be treated with no recognition that their outdoor knowledge and experience is that of a, maybe a white middle-class five-year-old. Because they've, mm. you know, that if, if you've lived in the suburbs your entire life, surrounded by concrete and cars, you know, you could be 50 years old and have that your entire life. You, you can't go and treat them like that person, like a 50 year old. You actually have to go and treat them like it's their first time and mm-hmm. give them a gentle way in, I suppose. Um, because I, I'm fed up at the moment. I've got my rants going. I stand on both chairs and rant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm fed up with people talking to me about the outdoors and backpacking and camping as this wet, cold, miserable, exhausting experience that really wasn't pleasurable. And yeah, like, do you ever get that? Somebody goes to you, oh, you must be crazy. Like, why do you do that? It's wet, cold and miserable. Does that happen to you? Yeah. I mean, I definitely know it's not for everybody. There's mm. different levels of, you know, getting outdoors. Outdoors could be going to a park or going on like a small nature walk, or it could be backpacking 15 miles, you know, it's, there's such a a range, but I think it is, like you said, so important for mental health that, yeah, just having access to safe outdoor spaces is such a big, important deal. Mm. Yeah, you're right. City parks would be another great place. Safe city, city parks to enjoy would be, is an incredible space. And, And tell me, when people talk to me about the wet, cold, miserable, exhausting sort of story of their, the outdoors and how they perceive it to be, it often baffles me because I've worked as a professional in the outdoors most of my working life. I've, 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 I can't remember the last wet, cold and miserable experience that I had in the outdoors. Like, do you have those or, or, or am I unique? Um, like, what do you think? <laughs> oh, I've definitely had some miserable nights <laughs> in the outdoors. Absolutely. The really? wind too, when the wind is just so strong and it's like your tent is just caving in on you and it's just, you're just like, I don't know. You're basically just trying to get through the night at that point, but <laughs> mm. yes, I have had some bad nights, but I mean, it's always a risk when you're going out um, in nature and I wouldn't say it's ruined my experience in any way. It is. Just, I feel like it makes me appreciate the good nights even more. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it changes quite quickly as well. Hey, it's not, you're often yes. not, it's often not weeks of wet, cold, miserable and horrible. It's often hours or a night or a day. It's not forever. Yeah. 
Yes. That's cool. Absolutely. That's cool. Well, listen, Melissa, I don't want to take any more of your time, but so thank you so much for coming and talking to me, talking to the We Get We Get Outdoors Nation, and. Um, uh, if, if any of you want to follow Melissa, and by the way, you should follow her, you should go and read her blog, you should check out the amazing photography on her Instagram page, <laughs> at miss.rover, link below. Um, it's super cool to have you. And um, I, and as does everybody else, look forward to following the development of your influencer career, the blogging, and seeing where it takes you to over the next, I don't know, 5, 10, 15, 20, I don't know how many years it is into the future. I'm interested to see where that goes too. <laughs> if, if, if you had a, a parting gift of words to, to say to people um, about the outdoors and why they should go traveling or go in the outdoors, what would it be? Hmm. I, I think just exploring the outdoors allows you to connect in a lot of different ways like connecting with nature connecting with people connecting with yourself and i have found so much value in that and i encourage anyone that hasn't to definitely get outside and and use that as an opportunity to i don't know work on yourself and your relationships and yeah <laughs> super cool melissa thank you for your time and i look forward to catching you very soon thank you thank you so much